Hi everyone, my name's Scott Bumstead. I'm the GM of operations here at Fitness Australia. And today, today I'm joined with Jen Dugard, the, the founder of uh, Body Beyond Baby, a level three Oz rep, as well as a board member for Fitness Australia. So welcome, Jen. Hey Scott, I'm pretty excited to be here today. Excellent. Uh, today we're taking a little bit different tact and we're here to talk about the Service Excellence Program, um, which encompasses our quality assurance employment as well as our OSREP accreditation, which is which is under trial phase. So fair, exciting projects, I suppose, that are in the pipe. <laughs> Very exciting. And I think, um, yeah, I'm excited about both these projects and I think delving a little bit deeper and making sure that um, all of our members really understand what Fitness Australia is up to is, is really important. So excited to get started. Excellent. So I suppose just if we, in the comments, if we just have, you know, maybe where, where you're from, people tuning in and listening, um, the, the types of businesses you're running or whether you're a exercise professional, just an, just an Oz rep uh, that's, you know, operating out of a park, whatever it may be, it'd be great if we could get some interaction from the audience as well as any any questions that we you may have feel free to put them in and Jen and I'll do our best to answer those as well. All right shall we get started with quality assurance employment so I'm going to fire a few questions to Scott um, and then when we we move forward we're going to kind of change things around a little bit keeping up a good conversation along the way. So um, Scott do you want to explain exactly what quality assurance is and how it works for anyone that's not sure? Yeah, sure. So the quality insurance employment refers to the Fitness Australia business membership. Uh, so when, when a business signs up to Fitness Australia, they agree to the National Fitness Industry Code of Practice. Um, and within that code of practice, it references the type of employees, um, qualifications and registration requirements that take place. Mm -hmm. um, and those currently state that uh, any exercise professional must be registered with Fitness Australia as an OSREP. Cool. And why did Fitness Australia feel like that's something that was needed in our industry? Yeah. So the in a, in a nutshell, it is to raise the standards of the industry, basically. Mm -hmm. um, now that has been clearly identified, you know, as we've been moving through COVID, uh, with the industry being grouped together with you know industries such as you know pubs, clubs, cafes, things like that. Um, now, I'm sure anyone watching this series or anyone that's within industry knows full well that there's a big difference between a, a bartender or a waitress at a cafe and what a exercise professional does on a daily basis. Um, you know, Oz reps and personal trainers in particular, you know, are, are, are trained and educated with improving health and well-being of individuals across across a board spectrum. Um, which we know categorically has flow on effects to things like, you know, improved mental health states across not only individuals, but, but communities a, as a whole. Yeah. yeah. And when we, um, when the whole COVID thing started to happen originally and we got bundled with pubs and clubs, it meant that our gyms got closed down super quick. And despite ex leaving the house for exercise being one of the number one um, things that we could keep doing. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, that's, that's absolutely critical. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for the, the industry to, to unify itself, um, which then provides the industry an ability to advocate to, you know, not only state, local, but also federal government. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the greatest wins I think the industries have is having, you know, um, ScoMo, try and pronounce bar, um, <laughs> spell, spell it out. Um, so, you know, there, there is, there is a, a strong advocacy ability that exists currently, um, but having, you know, a, a minimum requirement to have an exercise professional registered, adhere to ongoing education, have current first aid, CPR, et cetera, just provides that platform for the industry to leverage, you know, private health, um, cheaper insurance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down the track. Yeah. yeah. So many, so many benefits. So when we're talking about benefits, let's go into um, specific benefits for the business owner, I guess. So if you're a fitness business and you're committing to only employing um, Fitness Australia registered trainers. Yeah, so the, the critical one there is just quality assurance. So you know that if you're a, you're a business owner, every single one of your personal trainers, group exercise instructors, gym instructors have 
appropriate qualifications. Mm -hmm. um, they have first aid, CPR. Um, they're committed to ongoing education within their actual job set that they're delivering. Um, and it also provides, I suppose, that um, lower level advocacy if they're trying to set up, you know, referral networks within their local region with a local GP, physio, exercise physiologist, whatever it may be. It's just that level of assurance to those individuals. Absolutely. That, that link to allied health and making sure that we're upholding best practice within the fitness industry is, is so, so important. Yes, ab yeah. ab absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, and what about trainers? Um, what are the, what's the advantages to a trainer? Yeah. So the, you know, one, one of the key drivers of Fitness Australia is to provide um, exercise professionals that, that I suppose professionalizing their career and having their career recognized as what it should be that has, you know, significant impact on the general population's life um, or any population group that they're actually engaging with. So by being an OSREP, you have a clearly defined scope of practice that is recognized internationally. Um, so obviously Fitness Australia registration, if you're looking to move overseas, I was going to say in the coming months, but most likely in the coming <laughs> Maybe years not now. Yet. <laughs> yeah, um, we, we have international portability. So the, the critical thing with an OSREP registration is it does meet international standards, um, which is which is you know really important, especially when we are talking to government. That government turn around, they look at the standards that's required to become an OSREP, and it is matched internationally. You know, we are seen as the leaders internationally from that point of view. It, yeah. it all. Sorry. No, go on, carry on. Yep. Um, it, it, it also provides, once again, that, that um, I suppose, that advocacy base. Um, now, that's not just necessarily talking to government, but it is things when, you know, COVID rolls around and all of a sudden, you know, first aid CPR that requires face-to-face -face interaction shuts down. Mm -hmm. um, we can then turn around and negotiate with insurers on behalf of the industry to say, look, obviously, people aren't out doing um, their first aid certificate at the moment. We need an extension. Uh, which we've done successfully over, over the last couple of months that allows us to represent, I suppose, that professional industry base. Yeah, that's so important. I know there was a lot of people freaking out just going, what do I do? Um, and having Fitness Australia on your side or, or knowing that Fitness Australia is in your, in your corner is, um, is definitely a good thing. Um, in terms of consumers, Scott, what, what if so if, if a consumer is walking into a gym um, and they are a business member, what, uh, what is that business member basically saying to their, their consumers? Yeah. So the, the big thing coming out of COVID for me is going to be the consumer confidence. Mm. So um, providing that level of quality assurance that when I go into a facility, um, everyone that I engage with is going to be qualified for what they're actually going to prescribe to me, which is absolutely critical. Um, you know, you think back to any other um, profession that you engage with, whether it be GP, dentist, whatever, you know, you wouldn't go to an unregistered dentist at all. Um, you'd go to make sure they're actually registered. They have things like ongoing education. They understand what their scope of practice is. So that's critical over the next few months is, is I suppose, instilling that consumer confidence mm -hmm. that when I am engaged with my personal trainer, I'm going down to my group X class that the person that's that's instructing me what to do knows what they're doing and they're meeting best practice standards. Absolutely. It's interesting. We just had a question come through from Catherine, who, which says, um, with Victoria's high rise in cases, are you worried that restrictions will last longer and gyms in Victoria will stay closed for longer? Um, what's the industry doing about this? And I'll throw to you, Scott, but also I think that, you know, you basically just hit the nail on the head in that if businesses are aligning with Fitness Australia and they're only employing Ausreps in their businesses, then this is a direct, um, not reaction, but it, it helps to raise our industry to a higher standard so that we can all work together to get gyms closed, not as quickly and open sooner if and when they are. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Fitness Australia is in constant communication with all state governments. Um, yeah. You know, certainly since my time at Fitness Australia, this is the highest level of engagement we have ever had with, uh, with with state and federal government. And they are listening and we are in constant communication around the fact that, you know, one-on-one -on -one personal training uh, can be conducted in a, a clinical setting um, mm -hmm. where people's health and, you know, not transmitting communicable diseases can be prevented under, under the right protocols. Absolutely. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah we, we want to be recognized as those um, essential services, I guess. That, that's it. And that, you know, We've heard Barry and Jane talk, you know, fairly extensively last week about try and you know Fitness Australia's objective to reposition fitness closer to allied health, mm -hmm. and in reality, this is step one. Yep. You know, of, cool. of that process. Absolutely. So, Catherine, I hope that answered your question. Um, and Jason also, Scott, and I'll let you answer this one. <laughs> so, Jason owns a dance school in Melbourne um, with the DHHS constantly putting dance schools in the box of fitness. Will you in the future be looking to refine your regulations to provide guidance for dance schools? And if so, would becoming a member of your governing body be worthwhile? The answer today is yes. Um, <laughs> we, we, we are, I suppose, 100% aware that, that dance in particular has been um, aligned with fitness. Uh, we're currently working in the background to look at our membership offerings yeah. to include um, you know, non-specific exercise professionals. So over the coming weeks, um, we'll be in a position to announce a membership category, which we'll be able to pick up things like you know, dance businesses, dance instructors, and then we'll be able to advocate on their behalf as well as provide some governance over what is best practice moving through there. So that's, I suppose, watch this space with that one. Yeah, I know there's been a lot of conversations in the background of what parts of the industry are we looking after well and what other parts of the industry and the wider industry do we could we service and, and look after at the same yeah. time. Cool. Okay, so I feel like whenever we make a change in something, there's always this oh my goodness how hard is it going to be is it just going to put roadblocks in the way um so i guess for anyone out there that's thinking like becoming an accredited business is or a quality assured business is going to be hard work um or employees might feel like it's going to be harder to get a job what do you what are fitness australia doing to overcome this and make it kind of easy <laughs> Yeah, and look, while we we're going through our consultation with the industry, um, the 100% feedback was uh, there needs to be a removal of the barriers to joining Fitness Australia, especially around uh, exercise professionals. And we have worked fairly hard, I suppose, to reshape our offering in order to allow just about any individuals to join Fitness Australia as an exercise professional, and then we can work with them to make sure that they hit the standard of an OSREP uh, registration. The critical thing is with the OSREP registration is we haven't changed that standard. We've just made it easier to join. So mm -hmm. a few things like that, you know, during the COVID period, um, we've reduced prices of all individual registration. Um, we now have new offerings such as, you know, 12 month OSREP registration, which then once again, reduces the price, but also, um, you know, makes it more palatable for some individuals, especially people entering the industry. Mm. Uh, the, the big one is, as we're going through this process, if a exercise professional has a registration with, with another body, whichever body that may be, uh, Fitness Australia actually recognise that. So if I have six months left of my other registration body, uh, we will provide six months free OSREP registration. Um, work with them if they're coming from a body that maybe doesn't have um, you know, the requirement for ongoing education or whatever it may be, we'll work with them, provide them access to platforms such as iLearn for free in order to get them up to speed. Um, and then once that six months free uh, registration expires, then they can join Fitness Australia once again. Um, the, the other thing we're offering is a provisional category. So if you're a exercise professional that's been out of industry for five years, so you, you, know, you graduated eight years ago, you took a break and you're looking to come back into the industry, we can now register those individuals as provisional. And what we do over a three month period is give them access to programs like iLearn, which at zero cost, get their CECs, get them understanding what a scope of practice is, how to set up referral networks. And then they transition from a provisional category to a full OSREP. So what that does from a employer's point of view is when they're looking for their new personal trainer, their group X, their gym instructor, whatever it may be, they can employ the best candidate regardless of their registration status. And then we will work with that individual to make sure they meet the standards of OSREP uh, registration as quick as they possibly can. That's really cool. Cause there must be people out there now. And I know the fitness industry from one extent with COVID's taken a hit, but there's gotta be um, people ex fitness industry that 
are now potentially without work or they're in another industry and they're going, what are my options? What do I do? So to be able to bring them back in as a, you know, as that provisional member has to be a good, a good move for anyone looking to re-enter the industry. Absolutely. And it's about, you know, retaining the current workforce, but yeah. exactly right. So, you know, bringing people from other, from other industries that maybe have, have lost their jobs and they're looking to move in, you know, mm -hmm. it's just about making that transition or that entry as simple, pain-free and as cost-effective as we possibly can. So I feel as if the current offering goes a long way to answer a lot of those questions. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Do we want to move into Ausrep accreditation? <laughs> I really got that very mixed up. <laughs> sure. Um, okay. So I might take over. As cool. the interviewer at this stage. Cool. Um, so I suppose the OSREP accreditation um, is relatively new. You know, we haven't, we haven't launched it as of yet. Um, if you could just, I suppose, I won't get my head around, you know, what exactly it is, as well as your yep. initial thoughts. So I know you sat on the reference board for the OSREP accreditation. So if you just sort of unpack that. I did. Cool. So the first thing I guess I wanted to point out was the difference between registration and accreditation. So at the moment, the registration um, or to, to become an OSREP, you don't have to, although you need your CECs, you don't have to go through any kind of process to do that. It is a registration. So a register at the end of the day. Um, being part of that register definitely improves where you stand within the industry and you're associated with Fitness Australia. However, when we're talking about things like allied health, um, we want to really raise the standard of the fitness industry and have um, our professionals recognised as being of that high standard. So the accreditation is not just a tick and flick accreditation. It's not just, I want to be accredited, let's do it. Um, it's you go through a process and we'll, you know, we'll unpack the process as, as we move along the conversation. Um, and it's aiming to move us into the standard of allied health. Um, the other thing about the accreditation, it is optional, though um, I reckon everyone should do it, <laughs> uh, although I can say that. Um, and it's also at zero cost. So again, when we, we were talking before about making things accessible, what it's not is a revenue raiser. It's a, a raise the industry to a higher standard, but we don't feel like, oh, Fitness Australia doesn't feel like we should be charging Ausreps to do that. We want to you know, bring as many people along as possible and yeah, raise the standard of the industry. What do you reckon, Scott? Yeah, I think it's quite a turning point for the industry. Um, mm. So once once this launches to the industry, we now have the option to accredit both businesses as well as individual uh, or individuals across, whether they are personal trainers, uh, Group X instructors or, or gym instructors. So I suppose as you touched on, you know, there, there aren't many allied health streams out there that don't have accreditations and I suppose set those higher level of standards. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing around fitness is we do have a, a vast background of education. So we have, you know, vocational people which come out with a Cert 3-4 or a mm -hmm. diploma, but we also have, you know, exercise science, sports science, also even people with, you know, post-grade qualifications that are registering as OSREPs. So this to me, sort of levels that field and then says, these are the individuals that are, you know, professional and they're trying to make, you know, that long lasting career out of be becoming an OSREP or a personal trainer or whatever it may be. Absolutely. Yeah. It's definitely um, professionalizing the industry and having us be recognized by the allied health professionals, because I know um, even work, like working in the pre and postnatal space, like there's some, you know, we want to work alongside women's health physios, but there's physios that are just like, I'm not sending my my patients to a boot camp instructor or to a personal trainer because I don't know their standard of care. So if I could then go along to that physio and it could be any special population or any population and go, well, I'm a, an accredited fitness professional and these are the hoops I had to jump through to get it it automatically brings where I stand in the industry higher than those that are just sitting on a registration absolutely and I think it's probably important that we now have a look at I suppose how um, the accreditation probably working group in particular was formed so um, you know this isn't necessarily just fitness Australia sitting around saying let's do an accreditation yep. we'll make the standards <laughs> up make um, it up so yeah. So are you able to just break down what, where that working group and sort of the consultation process that took place in order for us to actually create the framework of that accreditation? Yeah, absolutely. So there was research done internationally and domestically um, to look around for accreditations. Um, and the Fitness Australia Board 
decided to pursue the OSREP accreditation. So that was a joint decision by, um, by the board, I guess. And then when we started to decide what should be in that, a group was put together of OSREPs. Um, so myself and Chantelle sat on um, in that group, along with academics from Vic, the Vic Uni. We had insurance providers give their input and, and help to decide what should go into the accreditation. Um, members of the Allied Health community, which is awesome because we want to be partnering more with Allied Health, obviously, and then board members too. So it's it's been a very well-rounded project and I know that um, the parts that I've played in have been very focused and, and really making sure that we're drilling down into what needs to be in there. Yeah. Excellent. So where, where's the program at at the moment? Okay, so at the moment um, we have done all the research and we've led, that's led into a request or a call out for a level three OSREPs to come forward to volunteer to be part of the pilot or the trial. Um, so we've got over 200, about 200 level three OSREPs enrolled in the program so far um, with the look to go into the testing period. Absolutely. I think um, talk, talking to some of our standards team here at Fitness Australia, uh, they are still interested in, you know, more people joining. So Maddie, I know you're listening. If you can just <laughs> maybe put the link to the email address up in the chat. Um, anyone that is interested, even if you're not a level three and, you know, you're maybe a level two Oz rep that wants to be one of the first level twos accredited in Australia, if you just register your interest, we'll make sure that you stay 100% up to date with as these as, as the program develops. Awesome. That's good to know because I thought the list was closed. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll, we'll all, yeah. E even if it goes onto a database that we can sort of just keep people up to date. You know, yeah. Anyone that's interested. 100%. Um, okay. So we know that the, the reference groups of high caliber, mm -hmm. um, including yourself, Jed. So I know there's a framework that takes place with, within the accreditation. Maybe we spend some time working through, I suppose, what that framework is and potentially what individuals going through this trial at the moment, but the rest of the industry later on will actually have to complete. And I suppose, you know, what's the accreditation built upon? Absolutely. So um, we've got a six pillar approach and Scott, I'm just going to open this to jump in at any time. Otherwise I could keep talking for a very long time. Um, so I'll move, move through the pillars, but yeah, like I said, Scott, if you, if I miss anything, jump in. Um, so pillar number one is an opportunity for self-reflection, which is really important because I think that we sometimes move through or we get so immersed in what we're doing that we don't take that time to kind of sit back and look at what we're doing and how we can improve. Um, so it's about asking people or OSREPs that go through the accreditation process to identify their key strengths um, and how they can maximize these in their practice. Um, and then identifying the importance of regular self-reflection throughout their career and then taking steps to kind of fill those gaps. So, you know, if there's something that you know you're not doing that well, how can you raise the standard of, of, of your practice? Um, and that leads into understanding the importance and creating a professional development plan. So you could be, um, I guess, you know, thinking ahead, a, a pretty new trainer um, with the with aspiring to specialize in a certain field and your professional development plan would take you through that process of, of specialization and starting with generalization. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I think with that one in particular, it's about just that continuous improvement. Mm. Um, so, you know, yes, you've, potentially achieved accreditation, but it's about, you know, reflecting on, you know, areas of strength, absolutely, but areas of development as well, and starting to work on those and, you know, really focusing on developing yourself from a professional standpoint. That's, I don't think we do that enough, do we? It's that yeah, slow down to speed up. Yeah, yeah that's it. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So that was number pillar number one. Um, number two is practical experience. So this we went backwards and forwards quite a quite a lot on this, working out how how many hours we thought that was a reasonable amount of hours to ask somebody who wanted to be accredited to do. And we've settled on 500 hours of practical experience, um, which could be 50 weeks of 10 hours a week. So it's not it's not not doable for somebody that's working part time, but obviously someone that's working full time could accrue those hours a lot more quickly. Um, good record keeping of sessions that you're doing and then also within your sessions, what you're doing within your sessions um, and also two, two years of proven experience. So someone and correct me if I'm wrong here, Scott, someone has to be a, an OSREP for a period of time prior to accreditation. That's where we're sitting at the moment. Is that right? Yeah, that, that, yeah. that's correct. And I think, um, 
it's it's really important that you know this accreditation is, is robust and we just mm. don't i suppose have the ability for um someone that's brand new into industry flagging themselves as accredited we want these people to be sort of you know the the champions of the industry that have significant experience um understand and then work forward yeah Absolutely. And then I guess the final part of that was um, a knowledge assessment. And this is not not how to do a squat. It's um, knowledge on how to become a higher level or better professional. Mm. Yeah, cool. Oh, no, sorry, I've got that mixed up. The knowledge assessment is the next pillar, my, my mistake. Um, so that that includes things like putting clients first, um, making sure you, you're operating a safe exercise business, um, professional practice and advice. So being able to risk assess and make sure you're looking after everyone that you're working with well. Uh, accident and injury risk assessments, which again is, is sitting in the kind of similar, similar spot. Um, scope of practice. So around effective and appropriate nutritional advice, making sure you're following all those guidelines for OSREP. So unless you've got specific nutritional um, accreditation, making sure we're sitting in that scope of practice. Um, and then also making sure that we know how to refer to other people. So where we step outside of that scope of practice, what is our referral um, network so that we can make sure our clients are being looked after to the best possible, possible way. And also understanding that we don't need to know everything. That's, I think, really important. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think when I, when I was going through this and sort of, you know, doing some internal testing myself, mm -hmm. this one to me just screams, you know, positioning those Oz reps in terms of align themselves with allied health and being able to set up those referral networks and being able to communicate with them correctly, mm -hmm. knowing when something sits outside of scope and it's potentially above their head. Um, but it also instills confidence for that referral to come back the other way. Um, so knowing when a GP has someone maybe with, you know, mild hypertension being able to refer to a OSREP in order to help work together in order to reduce that, um, that that's, yeah, probably my favourite part of, of when I went through the accreditation. I think one that, you know, just is absolutely critical that we get right. Yep, yep. 100%. I agree. I'm a big, big fan of understanding scope of practice and creating a really strong referral network that goes both ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Um, so pillar number four, we move into client feedback. So this is where um, your clients will submit feedback and surveys um, relevant to the job that you're doing with them. So you could be a group fitness instructor or personal trainer or um, GFI. Yep. I get those mixed up. <laughs> um, and the client has a review process that they go through and they can do at the in their own time um, so they go away and make sure that they're giving feedback on what you're doing in that professional environment um, then moving into a mentor and case studies and I love this one like I think there's been that big conversation in the industry for a long time of should we do cert three and four and then just get let loose into the industry without a mentor. Um, I'm a massive believer in mentors. So having trainers find a mentor and um, use case studies to work with that person during the accreditation process, I think is really strong and really relevant. Um, it gives a, a, tell us Scott, sorry, run through us the, um, the kinds of mentors that they can, they can find. So I know that we can do down the track, we're going to be using um, people that are already accredited, but for that short-term period, what, where are we going with that? Yeah. So in, in that interim period where, you know, we, we launch and we potentially don't have a lot of um, accredited OSREPs available, especially in regional areas, we, we can utilise things like level three OSREPs. Mm -hmm. um, they have the ability just to complete the, the mentoring session, which is an iLearn session, which will be free of charge. Um, so once they complete that, you know, they basically learn the basics of being a mentor and how to coach those people um, through being a mentee. Uh, and then we use, you know, we use that process in order to sign these guys off. Yeah, cool. And can people, I know we talked about this, can they use a, so let's say they've been working with a physiotherapist um, for a long period of time. Can they use that person as a mentor in this process? Yes, I, I, I believe I believe you can. I might I might take that one on notice though, Jen, um, yep. and, and come back to you on that one. That's a very technical. I know that question. we talked about it, yep. and I yep. And Chantelle and I did this section, but I don't know if it actually kind of made it through in the end. So let's reassess that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, and then finally, the self reflection and professional development piece. So um, 
making sure that as you come out of the accreditation, you have a really great capacity for goal setting and then ongoing professional development. Did you want to add to that at all, Scott? No, that's no? Cool. Exa exactly right. <laughs> and I, I suppose it's, it ties into the initial self-reflection um, and, that, and that last pillar being self-reflection, which once again ties into that continuous improvement. So yep. ideally, as we move through these modules, um, people will develop, they'll identify areas of development, they'll start to work on those. And then that self-reflection can be, I've identified this, whether it be through my mentor, whether it be through my skill and knowledge assessment, and I've actually worked better or imp improved myself in order to be a better exercise professional at the end of this, at the end of the process. Absolutely. And I think there's a massive opportunity for then, you know, take that last one and revisit it every six months. Like what is my self-development process? Mm -hmm. What is my professional development plan for the next six to 12 months way beyond accreditation? Yep. Yeah, cool. absolutely. Okay, um, so noting that this is in a trial phase, um, yep. and we've got you know two hundred ish people going through this at, at the moment. Um, what happens once the trial's over? Basically, um, after the trial's over, we get feedback from the people that have been through the trial, and it will be heavily reviewed. So, feedback from those people, reaching out to other industry um, providers to make sure that we've got everything in the accreditation that needs to be there. Um, and then I guess we're moving into providing updates of, of where the trial's at and then when we're open it to the, the general, when I say general public, I mean general fitness professionals. Um, and then hopefully Fitness Australia will be in a position to announce the industry launch date at the Filex event in September, which is exciting. Absolutely. And I think, I think there's probably two other critical points we just want to cover off on that. Um, we're currently in discussion with insurance providers. So, um, you know, over the the past few years, um, insurance premiums have been going up and up mm -hmm. and up within fitness. Um, so it'd be our goal to have a insurance partner come in um, that either freezes those insurance hikes uh, for accredited Oz reps or potentially, hopefully, reduce mm -hmm. those. Um, and I think this initial accreditation is sort of going to be a you know a, a general accreditation, um, but. We do have, I suppose, plans, and Jen, you might want to expand on this to move, <laughs> this move, into, <laughs> yeah, move into specialist accreditations once mm -hmm. we have, I suppose, that, that foundation of, of general accredited OSREPs. Absolutely. I think on the insurance piece, it's, you know, insurances go up when claims are made. And if we don't professionalise our industry and we don't kind of either cut out the people that are not upholding best practice or we don't bring best practice to a higher standard then insurance premiums are going to go up so you know my take on that is go get accredited let's raise the standard of our industry so insurance providers know that we're doing the right thing and we don't have to see insurance premiums going up and up and up um, and then the second bit about specialized specialization within the industry i get Scott, I mean, you know, it's like Jen won't stop talking about special populations, pre and postnatal, older adults, children, whatever it may be. Um, the vision is that not only are fitness professionals accredited, but we can go to the Fitness Australia website and we can look at the um, qualifications that they've done and they've passed certain things to say, I am accredited and specialised in this population in working with older adults, with working with disabilities. Um, and that's when we really start to professionalise our industry and get get recognized by those allied health yep super important absolutely yeah so i suppose i'll throw it open to we haven't had any questions in well, there's a, little a couple while. more questions but i just wanted didn't they weren't relevant so no they're relevant but weren't relevant to what we were talking about so sure cool. um yeah so i suppose in terms of accreditation yeah i think that's a pretty solid update um yeah. Do you want to go through some other questions that have come through? Or... Absolutely. And, and obviously throwing the floor open to any questions on accreditation. Um, but Gary asks, and I don't know if you know the answer to this. I have an idea, Scott. In New South Wales, how can, why is it, why is boxing pad workouts allowed when you are breaking social distancing? Yeah. So that, that comes down to, to contact sport. Mm -hmm. um so it's it's the same as you know when, when a sports training and it, there's contact there that's how i suppose we've been folded into to that aspect there so. and that it was a while though wasn't it where things like martial arts studios because they sat under a different code they got moved away from the general gyms and they got moved into their own kind of space and they were allowed to do that contact sport before we were fitness for boxing is that correct 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure of the the timeline on that. Yep. Um, but yeah, certainly my understanding is it's it's sort of just linked to that that sport contact. Yeah. Yeah, cool. At this stage. Would you say, and I don't know, again, I might be throwing you a curveball, but if you don't hold a boxing certification, could that be questioned in that space? Yeah, I think I think anyone that's um, that's conducting any thing outside of a, a anyway. traditional yeah they, <laughs> they should have some sort of qualification or you know learnings in that area in order to yeah be performing anything that sort of yep. sits in that scope yeah absolutely but I would say to Gary and anyone else like if you're not comfortable that that's not working for you in your gym or your clients uncomfortable just don't do it like there's other things that we can do instead of boxing hmm. um so another question will you be considering Will you be considering extension on registration to cover the period that we've been shut down due to COVID? Um, for example, mine ran out just before reopen in Victoria. We re-registered, then we shut down again with no income. It's hard to justify why we paid. Yeah. And the, the response to that one is that, you know, we, we have reduced our price between sort of 30 and 50% um, for, for registration period. So, um, that was done specifically for these shutdowns um, in order of putting an additional time period on. It's sort of the price has come off to cover that. Now, mm. um, you know, if Victoria, as an example, remains in lockdown for an extended period of time, we will constantly review that. Um, and we will always do the best we possibly can to assist the industry to, to stay on its feet and you know, really re-engage when things start to reopen. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I think that Reducing costs is a, you know, it's a nice thing to be able to do, but it's also, there's also that element of, you know, your industry body is actually working harder than ever for you during crisis periods. So you might not be at work and I, I'm obviously I don't want to, you know, talk to anyone's individual financial situations because I know this time can be extremely stressful. So this is not supposed to be a, an insensitive comment, but when we're aligned with our industry bodies for these times and when we're out of work, it's the bodies that are working really, really hard to get us back into work. So although it might not be, I, you know, it might not be an insurance thing as to why you register with Fitness Australia at the moment, but I'd, I'd encourage everyone to like look at the big picture and really understand what, what is being done behind the scenes and know that Fitness Australia for one is working harder than ever um, to use those dollars that you have paid to support you to get you working sooner rather than later. Absolutely. As well as we are making things like iLearn available yep. for, for all OzReps, um, which will then actually have a carryover into the OzRep accreditation. So, you know, while we have downtime, specifically mm. in Victoria, now now's a great time to start to invest some of that, that free time into upskilling yourself. And, you know, once we do relaunch, um, you'll be in hopefully a better position. In yeah. Absolutely. And the other thing I'm going to talk, talk to it from a business perspective is if your business isn't set up yet to operate in any environment, it's a big kick up the bum to go, okay, um, putting into your terms and conditions. If, if this happens again, how do you keep your business going? So can do you, can, do, is it Zoom workouts? Is it online workouts? What are you building to make your business more resilient? I'm digressing, so I'm going to bring it straight back. <laughs> um, Christopher asked a question. I'm keen to know how group training will be impacted after Christmas. Specifically, my business was based upon group activity and with restrictions in place as they are, it drops to a big stop, a big stop. I guess I feel like we've kind of covered that, but what do you think, Scott? Yeah, and I think that's, I'm not sure where, which state no, uh, Christopher's sure, yeah. come from. Um, you know, if you're sort of over West, um, mm. they won't be impacted much at all. They, they seem to be kicking goals with containing COVID and not having community transmissions. But um, yeah, with, without knowing which state, I, I think that's pretty, pretty hard to, pretty hard to answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, I just think that it's a, a trigger for us to build the resilience of our, of our businesses so that they can operate either in person face-to-face -face or virtual face-to-face -face. Um, and if that's not working then to look at the other opportunities within your fitness businesses to what other products you can add um, don't go down without a fight is what I would say <laughs> that's absolutely couldn't yeah. agree more yep um Christopher's in Victoria so I understand the concept of that question a little bit more yeah yep. so I'll just I suppose expand on that and that you know Vic Victoria I'm a, I'm a Victorian you know we're going through some tough times with with very very high level community transitions mm. um i suppose you know our our eastern manager david batty is in constant communication with with victoria health and you know being able to provide 
you know, viable outcomes for our industry as we start to roll back these restrictions is at the forefront of our mind. Um, and I, all I, I suppose I can do is reassure that those conversations are taking place almost on a daily basis with, uh, with Vic yep. Health in particular. Yep. Yep. That's about it for today, Scott. So hopefully we've covered off everything or most of the things everyone needs to know about the two exciting new programs that are coming to Fitness Australia or are already in motion. Um, I've had fun. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for your time, Jen, and thanks for everyone for tuning in. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye.